I've had the honor to the theater program here at Sarah Lawrence. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, this is a very exciting evening. I was at a loss as to how to introduce our distinguished guests, so I fell back on alphabetical order. Um, uh, Jane Alexander has won Tonys, Emmys, Drama Desks, Obies. She's received four Academy nominations. She appeared in 15 Broadway productions and has been nominated for Tony nominations in seven of those, a batting average that A-Rod would be jealous about. Um, in 1993, she left the stage to uh, leap into government serving as Bill Clinton's uh, head of the National Endowment of the Arts. Um, out of that came a wonderful book called Command and Performance about her experiences in the halls of government. Um, I'm happy to say she's returned to film and stage and, uh, of course, is currently starring in Chasing the Name, uh, Tina Ha, who is our next guest. Um, Tina also has a long list of awards to her credits. Uh, OB is drawn as Circle Awards, Outer Circle Citations, Pulitzer Prize and Tony nominations, both the Sidney Kingsley and William Inch Distinguished Achievement Awards. And she herself has been granted fellowships from the Rockefeller and Guggenheim Foundations, the National Endowment of the Arts, among others. She also holds two honorary degrees, and her long list of plays includes The Art of Dining, Coastal Services, and Painting Churches, to name but a few. Our moderator tonight, our moderator tonight is... Minor artist. <laughs> <laughs> is the witty Ed Sheridan, um, um, who uh, has achieved great success both in the theater and behind the camera in television and film. Um, he's received the Drama Desk Award for Great White Hope, which was one of his early collaborations with Jane Alexander, um, which um, also resulted in the marriage, which is now in its 34th year. Um, he served as seven, for seven years as the producer of Law & Order, producing 163 episodes of that popular television drama, and in 2002 was honored by the Directors Guild of America with their Robert Aldrich Award, for extraordinary contribution to the drama studio, and I'm also pleased to say his current film and faculty at Sarah Lawrence College. So please welcome all three of us. Thank you. Uh, I will now commence to moderate. <laughs> Essentially, I want to stay out of this conversation. It's much like I direct Jane. I just stay out of the conversation. <laughs> uh, and I can attest to the, uh, to the effect, the good effect of that, uh, out of the seven Tony nominations that Jane has gotten, I have directed five. <laughs> uh, Tina and Jane, well, I should absolutely recuse myself. I'm married to Jane, as you've heard, and I also, also wanted to be married to Tina. <laughs> <laughs> From their collective CDs, uh, Tony's, Emmys, Oscars, Obie's, Grants, Awards, Fellowships, Commissions, Honorary Doctorates, Published Books, Plays, Monographs, Public Service, political activism, they rain down on us like snowflakes in a blizzard. During their professional careers, few people have been so honored. It seems to me like an occasion to be valued as well as remembered. Full circle, as the evening is called. I say full circle, not quite. Tina House, Sarah Lawrence, 59, Jane Alexander, Sarah Lawrence, 61, have been friends for 50 years. 50 years. Jane directed and starred in Tina's first play when they were students here. As Tina recently said at the Dramatist Guild dinner, they were precocious toddlers, barely out of diapers. <laughs> and A.S. Din also said, less recently, each friend represents a world in us, a world possibly not born until they arrive. And it is only by this meeting 
that a new world is born. When did all this begin, Tina? It probably began, uh, for some strange reason, I was a, a um, transfer student. I'm older than Jane. Jane is a mere child. Um, there were a group of us transfer students who were put off campus in Cobra House. And I just remember this spectacularly beautiful young girl with shiny chestnut hair down to her waist, even below her waist, who had a way of tossing her head this way and that, so the hair would sort of move this way and that, lowering her eyelashes, and being very demure, but also when she got on stage, uh, the stage of Sarah Lawrence, she had all the fire of the world inside of her. And so I remember first seeing Jane and marveling at her, at her beauty and at what a compact, relaxed container she was. She's a very compact, relaxed container. <laughs> all the stuff inside of her. So when you're a 12 foot tall, freaky looking, you know, creature who comes to Sarah Lawrence and sees this beautiful, relaxed contain container, you sort of marvel and, and it took a while before I got to know her, but the first impression I will never forget. And Jane, likewise? Well, I remember it as a sophomore being put in Cobra House, uh, sort of off campus, <laughs> with a lot of juniors and seniors. And Tina was on the floor below me, and uh, she was unmistakable. She looked very much like she looks yeah. right now. Absolutely the same beautiful, long, slim, tall glass of water body. <laughs> the same wonderful hair. And she was wonderfully zany and wild then. She had a, a joie de vivre that she's never lost. And it, and it comes out in her writing. And I was um, lucky enough to be in the theater program, and we didn't do student productions then like they do today of student work, per se. Um, and I don't remember quite how I read Closing Time, but it was, I believe, Tina's first play. Yes. Yeah. And it was highly imaginative and um, it, it was unlike anything that I'd ever read. I think that it was closer to the theater of uh, the absurd that we were reading about and a little bit in classes at the time. Ionesco and uh, I don't think Janae was in the theater of the absurd. Well, I never studied theater at Sarah Lawrence. <laughs> so um, I, was, I was in a fiction class and I was hopeless and they made this rubber stamp worse than class. <coughs> it was stamped affixed to my forehead and I remember I had a you know, a big short story due at the end of the semester, and, and it was, and I was so bad. I mean, if the writer knows that they're bad, then you're, you're sort of screwed before you even, even try to finish. And so, out of frustration, I thought, well, I'll write a play, because in a play, you don't have to describe anything. You just put some evil in a situation, and they will take over. And I think the way Jane got the play was because she was the star of every show that was done at the college, and so, I, of course, gave her my play and said, what do I do with this? And Jane, being a frisky soul, soul at heart, said, well, I think I want to um, produce it and direct it. And because all the theater department had to hear was Jane's name and I direct, start. They said, yes, yes, they would do it, not knowing what they had in store for them. So um, I'm sure that I was the one who approached her about it. And, um, and I think because it was written by one of our own, and because it was a rather pretentious little offering um, about the end of the world, about <laughs> waiting for the end of the world, and this from somebody who had never read Beckett, who had never seen Beckett, but something was in the air, um, and to make it even more preposterous, most of the characters were pigeons, perched on very large and tall stepladders, who <laughs> sort of called out gibberish during most of the play, which Jane stayed with incredible delicacy 